guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. That's right, the it factor. I don't even know how to say it, but we're talking about it. Some people just have it, don't they? Just think about who you admire that has the it factor. I'll give you my list. Oprah, The Rock, The Dalai Lama, Taylor Swift. Oh, and the late Robin Williams and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Those folks, they have the it factor. Why? Well, because they have this ability to make me lean in and care about what they're saying. We not only admire folks like this, but we like them and we trust them. That is the heart of having the it factor. And based on the research, when people have the it factor, you know what it means? It means they have charisma. Charisma is a really cool thing because charisma will make you more influential. It'll help you make a bigger impact. And charisma absolutely is going to help you make some more money because according to the research, 82% of people's impression of you is based on whether or not you display charisma. Did you hear that? 82% of someone's impression of you based on whether or not you got charisma. I know I said it twice. That's how important it is. And here's the coolest thing about charisma. It's really easy to hack when you know the simple things you need to do. So today, here's what we're doing on the show. You're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language, Vanessa Van Edwards. She's a behavioral investigator, the founder of the research group Science of People, the author of the best-selling books on these topics, Captivate and Cues, and she's here to prove to you that you have the it factor. Yes, I'm talking to you. And the skill of charisma, that is how you are going to bring your it factor to life so you can make an impact, you can influence people, and you can make more income. Let's go, man. Class is in session. I am so excited for this. So let's dial up the skill of charisma. Let's bring the it factor to life. Let's increase our influence, impact, and income, people. And let's welcome Vanessa to the Mel Robbins podcast. I'm so excited for this. Vanessa, I'm so glad you're here. Well, welcome. I'm so psyched you're here. I'm so happy to be here. I can't even tell you. Well, let's just jump right into it because you have written the book oh. on both charisma and body language. And so I want to start with what is charisma and why does it matter? What people don't realize is that charisma, more than any other attribute, is the single most important aspect of you being successful. It helps you in your relationships. It helps you professionally. It helps people take you seriously. It helps you also feel more confident and purposeful in your interactions. So charisma is that missing ingredient that we need to trigger or activate our success. Wow. I mean, you hear so much about confidence. You hear about extroverts versus introverts. But how is it that charisma impacts all those things more than your personality or confidence? When research looks at highly charismatic people, they find that we are looking for people who are signaling high charisma because it shows all those other things. Highly charismatic people are confident. They are competent. They are warm. They are likable. And so the most amazing aspect of charisma is it can be learned. It is not an innate trait. You don't have to be born with it or not. That anyone can, be, can learn how to be more charismatic through a very specific set of cues. That's crazy. And you, you say that you were very awkward before you leveraged all the cues you're about to teach us. Will you tell us a little bit about what you struggled with? So what's funny about charisma, I've always been fascinated by this trait. I'm a recovering awkward person. <laughs> so, charisma does not come naturally to me. I've always been fascinated by the cool kids. You know, I watch them and I'm like, oh, how do they know what to do? And so I was for many years trapped by this mistaken belief that to be charismatic, you have to be extroverted. You have to be bubbly. You have to be the life of the party. And I am not an extrovert. And so I always thought, well, I guess I can't have it. It's an innate trait. You have to be extroverted. But research actually finds is that charisma has nothing to do with your extroversion, your attractiveness, your athleticism, even your intelligence. The actual definition of highly charismatic people, what makes them different is they set, send a very specific set of social signals. Specifically, they are constantly signaling high warmth, so trust, likability, friendliness, along with, and this is the key, a balance of high competence, capability, 
power, effectiveness. And what's magical about this is if you're with someone and you are drawn into them, you immediately are able to answer two questions. I can trust you and I can rely on you. And so highly charismatic people, that's what they're signaling, warmth and competence at all times. Wow. Okay. So let me see if I just can bottom line this. Yes. So charisma, if you have charisma or you display charisma, I guess is what I should say. Yes. If you display charisma, other people are left with the impression that they can trust you and that they can count on you. Is that, that right? Is, that is exactly right. And the funny, the, the hard part about this is you can be the warmest, most competent person in the world, but if you don't show those signals, the world does not believe you. And this comes from amazing research out of Princeton University, which found that under signaling, so not signaling enough. And this is what happens, I think, with very smart people. So most of my students are high, off the charts, intelligence, high achievers, and they think, oh, my smarts will speak for me, right? I, I'm really smart. I can make it through anything. I'm super prepared. I have great answers. And the problem is they under signal the warmth and competence cues. And what Dr. Fisk found, the creator of this research, she found that without enough warmth, people do not believe your competence. So the problem of smart people is they think their smarts work for them, but if they're not using the right signals, the world literally cannot believe them. Wow. That's so, so is this why charisma matters? So I think of charisma like a lubricant, right? So when we're in social That's sexy. Yeah, a social <laughs> That is lubricant. not exactly the word I was, that I thought that, or the metaphor I thought you were going to use. Okay. So charisma... <laughs> It makes is a social smooth. lubricant, everybody. Yeah. Okay. It makes it smooth. You know, it makes it smooth. Because listen, my interactions, my social interactions before I learned this science were like the opposite of smooth. They were crunchy, like not in a good way, right? Okay. Like, so you said you were awkward. Give us an example. I, Come on, I'm Vanessa. A I'm a recovering awkward person. So awkwardness. Let's talk about awkwardness is one of my favorite topics. Awkwardness dresses up in different ways. So my awkwardness, and everyone has a different things. So I'm curious, Mel, if you have any awkwardness, how it dresses up. Some people, they feel awkward because of fear. Their fear of being rejected, fear of being criticized, fear of saying something silly or sounding stupid. And so their awkwardness will dress up as shutting down. So for me, my awkwardness, I'm an overthinker. I'm the person who I get in bed at the end of the night and I literally rethink every conversation I've had the whole day. <laughs> Right. Or like I, I overanalyze my answers before I even say anything, which makes me mm -hmm. a terrible conversational listener. So my awkwardness would make me shut in, shut down. And so my introverts listening, this is often what happens when you feel awkward, you're afraid of a silence or being judged. You shut in, you close down, you stop talking. Other people, my extroverts, their awkwardness dresses up as something else. Their awkwardness dresses up as showing off over the top, being a drama queen, talking too much. Some of my extroverted, awkward friends, they'll say, sometimes I can't, I just can't stop talking. Literally my mouth just keeps going. And so awkwardness is this really interesting way that we try to cover our fear. And so when I say I'm a recovering awkward person, I've had to conquer a lot of internal fear to be able to have interactions that I desperately, desperately want to have. That could be in a professional setting, sharing my ideas, but it also could be just trying to make good friends, trying to be open with my partner and so I think that charisma is this lubricant because awkwardness makes our relationships, our conversations, our communication crunchy, awkward, halty. We talk too much. We talk too little. There's an awkward silence. We don't know what to do with our hands, right? We're like, what do I do with my body language? We make weird faces. We awkwardly nervous laugh. So my, my goal with charisma, what I've found is that it's a smoother, it's a lubricant, which I just, I, we have to stick with that metaphor. Well, it's hilarious. Yeah. And it also makes it, it, it you, when you use the word crunchy about those moments when you feel awkward, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because whether you're an over talker, over sharer, nervous laugh, interrupting people because you're extroverted, but you feel afraid of how people are going to view you or whether you withdraw because you're afraid that crunchiness is that sort of disruption you feel internally. And so I love this idea that charisma, which you say is a skill that anybody can develop, mm -hmm. that charisma helps you be yourself 
and it helps you be more influential and it helps you enjoy social settings, whether you're introverted or extroverted. That's what, that's what I'm kind of getting from this. Oh, that's it. And so I think that what we're looking for here is a lot of people talk about confidence and I love confidence, but I am not naturally confident. And so what would happen is I would say, just be more confident. Like I would, you know, I'd be like trying to mantra myself into it. And if you tell someone who's awkward to just stop being awkward, it, it doesn't work. Yeah, well, so it just I, makes you more awkward, I think, because then you're now focused on the fact that you're awkward. It's like a meta meta, right? Like I worry that I'm a worrier and that, mm-hmm. that makes me worry. You know? <laughs> so, right. So like, it's like a horrible meta. So what I say is, okay, I like confidence, but let's put it to the side for a second. Let's talk about being purposeful. Purposeful is much more impactful and active. It's, it's an active emotion. Okay. So if I say, I want to show up in this interaction as highly charismatic, I want to be my warmest self and my most confident self. And I want to clearly signal with purpose to the other person, I am trustworthy and likable, but I can also get it done. I'm powerful and capable. The key here is the balance. Most of us have an imbalance. So there's four segments of the population. This is what the research finds. There's the sweet spot of highly charismatic people, high warmth, high competence. That's the rare birds among us. Now, can you give us an example of somebody who is highly charismatic? Let's do the classic Oprah. Okay. Oprah is highly charismatic and here's why she can be in an interview and she can make the other person feel so comfortable. They share their darkest secrets. That's warmth. Mm. That's trust. She can cry with the other person. She can mimic their facial expressions. She, her warmth literally draws out other people's warmth. However, you also take her very seriously. You know, she is smart. She knows her answers. You can't sneak something by her. And that's her signaling. I'm competent. I'm going to make sure that I get to the truth here. You can rely on me to ask the hard questions. That's the perfect example. What Oprah does and what most charismatic people do, which I want to teach everyone who's listening how to do, is you can use charisma like a dial. It's just like a thermostat. So in some situations, when you want to dial up a little bit extra warmth, you can use more warmth cues. And Oprah does this exceptionally well. In her hard-hitting interviews, she'll dial up competence. She'll hit them with the hard right. questions. Go watch her interview with Lance Armstrong. I talk about uh, Lance Armstrong a lot in the book. I pick on him a lot. Her interview with Lance Armstrong, she is high competence. She has just enough warmth to make him feel comfortable, but she asks hard questions. Versus some of her other interviews, she's dialing up warmth. She wants to make the other person feel comfortable. So that's an example of someone who's very uh, nice balance and kind of uses her warmth and competence as a dial. Let's look at, for example, Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs is- often- Zero warmth. I'm, am I? No, zero warmth. Zero Steve warmth. Jobs. Like, oh, zero man, warmth. What a, the guy's a jerk. Zero warmth. So he is the perfect example of high, high, high competence. He has, he's constantly signaling, take me seriously. I'm powerful. And most importantly, what highly smart people don't realize is if they- over signal competence, people see them as cold, intimidating, not a collaborator, not a team player, hard to talk to. So yes, he, he was brilliant, but his lack of warmth made people feel like he wasn't a collaborator. He wasn't a good team player. And his legacy is changing the world, but also being not kind. So that's an example of high competence. My highly smart people, my engineers, my really technically brilliant folks, they often get trapped and high competence because they don't know how to signal warmth. Mm. By the way, they might have all the intention to be a collaborator, but we are not taught how to signal warmth. And so they go, well, I guess I don't know how to do that. So that's high competence. That's one bucket. And by the way, so if you're, as you're listening, I want you to think about what sounds like you, what feels like you. So do you feel like you have the balance? Do you feel like, no, you're off the charts in competence? You know, you're high in competence. If people always think you're in charge, you know you're high in competence if people have ever told you that you're intimidating or hard to talk to. You know that you're in a relationship or have a partner who's high in competence if they constantly Google fact check you. <laughs> so highly competent folks, their mission is to get it right. They are very uh, dominated by the idea of get it right, get the facts. And so they'll be in a conversation with you and be like, let me Google fact check that. Let me just see if that's... <laughs> That's right. Do they share their emotions if they're high competent? Usually less. They're much less comfortable sharing their emotions because vulnerability 
sharing emotions is an aspect of warmth. So that mm. is one way that competent people can hack warmth is sharing more of their emotions, but usually they don't like that as much because emotions aren't correct, right? It's hard to be right with emotions. So they'll often, the reason why a highly competent partner, I have one of those is I, I'm going to use the word afraid of emotions or uncomfortable with emotions is because it can't be fact checked, right? Hmm. If someone says as a partner, um, I feel upset with you. How do you verify that? How do you fix it? Where's the solution? A highly competent partner, they love solving things, right? You come to them and you're like, I'm just having a bad day. And they're like, let me fix that for you. And you're like, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to listen. And they're like, oh, no, I don't know how to do that. Cause they're fixers. Got it. So highly competent people, you have that super strength of, of getting it right, being fixers. Warm folks, my warm folks. So my highly warm folks, you are filled with empathy, your cheerleaders, your supporters, your mission. So if competent people want to get it right, highly warm people want to be liked. They mm. want everyone to feel good. They want everyone to feel comfortable. Typically, highly warm folks, their super strength is empathy, nurturing, making people feel loved and warm. But they often give too much of themselves in sacrifice of being liked. Got it. So like people pleasing doormats is what you're talking about. That's the far end. People yes. pleasing is what they struggle with. And so I think that highly warm folks in the workplace, this is the other really important thing to understand is if you're highly warm, you are fighting a battle in yourself, which is your desire to be liked gets in the way of your need to be respected. Mm. Okay. Stop. I need everybody to hear that. If you default and you are too warm, especially at work, your need to be liked is getting in the way of your need to be respected. Yeah. And when you are too focused on getting it right and too focused on being smart and too focused on dominating the conversation or the knowledge bank, your need to be right is dominate. It, 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 how did you say your need to be need right? To be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. Yes. Yes. Your need to be right is getting in the way of your need to be liked. That even rhymes. That's amazing. I didn't I want to do go, that on purpose. <laughs> I want to go back to something in the very beginning that we were talking about. Yes. So when I asked you what is charisma yeah, and you said, it has nothing to do with personality. It has nothing to do with introversion or extroversion. It is not about being confident. That charisma is something that you display to other people, correct? Yes. And charisma matters because if you have charisma, people trust you, they like you, they count on you which I would think means it makes you in, more influential, it makes you more successful, it makes you have greater influence. Is that what the benefits of charisma are? Influence, impact, and income. So the reason Whoa. why- Hold yeah. on, hold on. So charisma yeah. impacts the three eyes. The three eyes, all three of them. Why? If you are warm and competent, you are less likely to be underestimated you're less likely to be dismissed and doubted. Why? We are attracted to highly charismatic people because charisma is contagious. And they have actually proven this in the lab. The more charismatic you are, the more you clearly and purposefully, I keep using the word purposeful on purpose, the more clearly you signal warmth and competence, the more contagious you are. We like to be around warm, competent people because they make us more warm and competent. And so nonverbal signals, vocal signals, verbal signals, we are constantly aware of because we want to catch them. So the reason why we're drawn to people who are the in, that influence piece, that influence or impact piece is because we are influenced by people who we want to be contagious with. Mm. We also want to be more warm and competent. So if we're around someone who's warm and competent, it makes us feel like our best selves. If you think about the most, the most charismatic person, you know, so just think about them for a second, they make you feel better. They make you feel like your best self. That's the difference. I think between, for example, a highly charismatic person and a narcissist, right? Like this is not just about confidence. It's about someone who actually is positively infectious. 
And they've proven this with both negative and positive cues. So for example, um, Dr. Matthew Lieberman at UCLA, he flashed people a fear microexpression. So fear microexpression is when we raise our eyebrows up our forehead and we white, widen our eyes so our whites show and we take in a deep breath. So we go, <gasps> yes. So that expression, if he flashes that expression to someone in a fMRI, their amygdala where they process fear begins to activate. We catch the fear. Literally just seeing someone with a fear face makes us feel afraid. The most important part of this experiment though is the moment that someone labeled the fear. So in their head or out loud said fear, it deactivated their amygdala. Hmm. In other words, being aware of the cues that are being sent to us, both negative and positive, makes us aware of who is infecting us. So that influence, that impact is that highly charismatic people are so clear with their signals. They're, it's like they're gifting, another Oprah reference, they're gifting warmth for you, competence for you, charisma for you, and not charismatic people, people who are anxious, afraid, awkward, they are signaling negative cues. That's why we don't want to be around them. We don't want to catch that fear, right? Like we don't want that fear. And so we're like, whoa, I don't like those signals. And so we avoid them as much as we possibly can. You know what I love about your research? What I love is that, first of all, you're about to teach us all how to become more charismatic. You're oh, yeah. also about to give us hacks related to body language and getting intentional about what we're displaying and signaling. Yes. But what I also love about your research is that I need everybody listening to understand something. Right now, you are unintentionally sending signals and cues to people. That's it. You are walking around and whether it's a negative mood or it's anxiety, or it's insecurity, or it's awkwardness, or you're so focused on being right that you don't realize that you're sending signals and cues that make people not like you and not trust you, or you're so focused on being liked and that you're sending these signals of being a warm pushover, which is why you're never respected and why you're passed over at work. And so what I love about this research is that you're helping us focus on two factors that you can display that will increase influence, impact, and income. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you're shy or whether you're bossy. These strategies are going to work for all of us. Mm -hmm. One thing I would love for you to talk about before we talk about the cues is this. So in that study that you cited from Princeton, Yes. They also found that charisma accounts for 82% of how people evaluate you. So can you unpack that? Because I think it's really important for us to understand. This is not only a good idea because you're going to make more money, be more influential, and make a bigger impact. Based on the science, this is how people view you. And so can 82%. you unpack this for us? So I was also shocked by that number. By the way, it's very rare to see a number that big in science, right? Especially because if I were to ask someone, how do you want to be perceived? You're going to get a list of a hundred adjectives, funny, extroverted, bubbly, attractive, whatever. Actually, when someone is interacting with us, and by the way, this is not just in person. This is on your LinkedIn profile in Zoom, on the phone, in chats, in Slack, in DMs, in your email inbox, people are using warmth and competent signals to make up 82% of their judgment of you. Okay, stop. Everybody, did you just hear that? People are using warmth and competence, which are the two things that make up your charisma. 82% of how people judge you, evaluate you, size you up, decide to hire or date you has to do with whether or not you're warm or competent. That's bananas. It's bananas. And it's not just your first impression. It's actually every single impression. So yes, your first impression is important. But even if you don't feel you've had a good first impression, that's okay. We are reevaluating this on every Zoom call. If someone sees your name pop up in their inbox, 
they're also wondering, is this, a, is this a warm and competent email? In other words, can I trust this email? Can I rely on this email? The hmm. more warm and competent your email is, the faster response rates you're going to get. We as humans have a really hard time responding to, connecting with, building rapport with, being impacted by people who under signal or people who signal in an imbalanced way. So what we're talking about here, that 82% is making it easier for people to interact with you. I believe that your warmth and competence tells the world how they should treat you. Wow. So and it, you here's want what I treated. believe, Vanessa. You want to hear what I believe, Vanessa? Yes. I believe we all have a huge blind spot when it comes to what we're signaling other people. That you may think you know how you come across and what you're displaying, but I have a feeling that we are about to learn from Vanessa that we have a massive blind spot when it comes to warmth and confidence and how you're displaying charisma or not. So how can we, number one, figure out how charismatic we are? What okay. do we do, Vanessa? Okay. All right. So first, we're the first kind of diagnostic that I talked about was just which one sounds more like you. That's where we start, right? So where do you think you fall? You hire in warmth, hire in competence, you have a balance, or are you under signaling, right? Do you shut down and not signal enough? Okay. The next thing you can do is you can actually do our diagnostic. It's totally free. And I love this because there's two ways that you want, I want you to do this. You can take this as many times as you want. The whole point, I, the reason I put it up from the research is because I want people to be able to Take a diagnostic, see how they come across. So they're going to be very simple questions. Does that mean like, a test? Yes, it's a test. Okay. Really simple test, sciencepeople.com slash charisma. Wait, hold on. What's a, what, 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 is, what is the URL? Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. Wait, is that the New York Times Science of People? No, just my <laughs> Science of People. Oh, that's your site. Okay. Scienceofpeople.com slash charisma. We will put that in the show notes. So you can take this test. As many times as you want. And so first I want you to take it as you. I want you to take it as you. And I want you to take it not on your ideal self, your real self. Okay. Okay. okay? So on a, on a normal day, I want you to screenshot your results. Then what I want you to do is I want you to do a 360 review. I want you to send the quiz to a partner, a friend, a colleague and ask them to take it as you. This is the key because it's going to show you how other people see you and mm -hmm. have them screenshot the results and then go to dinner and get a lot of wine because it'll be a great <laughs> conversation. <laughs> so do you find that most people have no idea how they're showing up with other you, people? You were right. Most of us have a blind spot. We think, we hope, we think of ourselves as our ideal selves. And there are days, of course, where we are a little closer to that sweet spot of warmth and competence. But what's really key, what we find is that not only are people giving them different results, but they even might even have different results for home and work. So they're showing up as two selves. And that's a very important thing to know about yourself. If you're going to work and you're dreading it, you're burnt out, you're drained, it could be that you are not honoring who you truly are because you're either under signaling competence or under signaling warmth or trying to fake it till we make it. I have a little problem with that phrase. I don't love that phrase because I, I think it. that the problem is if you're going to fake warmth, it's exhausting, right? And so this is also a way to sort of get a very quick snapshot in how are people perceiving you and is it what you think you're showing? Um, you also have a suggestion that we record our Zoom calls in order to read how charismatic we are. That sounds horrible. It's horrible. I'm not going to lie. It is horrible. And not only do I want you to record a Zoom call, I want you to record a Zoom call that you worked hard on. Presentation, an important client meeting, a call, and then I want you to code it. So when we talk what about- What does code it mean? Okay. So when we talk about cues, so cues are the social signals humans send to each other. Okay. There are four different modes of cues. Verbal, the one we talk about the most, so our words. This is what we most of us think about all the time. We want to prepare the perfect answer, share the perfect presentation, we practice our stories. So verbal is only one mode of cues. Second is nonverbal, our body language, our gestures, our facial expressions. The third, the most important one that's overlooked is voice tone, our vocal power, our volume, our pace, our cadence, our tone. And the last smallest one is ornaments. The jewelry we wear, what's behind us in our background, uh, the, the color of our nails, how we wear our hair, our glasses, those are the ornaments. What I want you to do is I want you to code yourself for every cue that you're showing. 
everything from how many gestures you're using to what your facial expressions are doing, to your movement, to your fidgeting, to your vocal power, to the kinds of words you're using. That's also going to give you a snapshot because what we've found in our research is that there are certain very clear signals of warmth, cues of warmth, and cues of competence. And the last one are danger zone cues, cues that are negative. My goal, this is a way that you can see is how are you signaling warmth and competence? What are you doing with your body and your, va your voice and your face that's making people treat you the way that they're treating you? Guess what we're talking about today? You and me, baby. We're talking about the it factor. Some people just have it, don't they? And based on the research, when people have the it factor, it means they have charisma. So today, you're going to meet one of the world's leading researchers and experts on charisma and body language.